I am a bit sick and tired of the lectures and pontification from the Greens in relation to renewable energy, and as if they were the only ones who cared about the climate. They, and you know, this position that they're putting up now is that they want the complete decarbonisation of the Australian economy. I'm not sure over what period this complete decarbonisation will take place, but I know from a Labour perspective, we would like to see the economy decarbonised over a period of time, but it has to be done on the basis of taking into account the national interest the interests of communities that are reliant on coal, reliant on coal-fired power stations. And I brought my kids up in Musselbrook. I was a worker in a coal-fired power station, so I know how much a lot of these workers rely on coal and coal-fired power stations for their future. So I agree with the theoretical position of decarbonising the economy. But I am also pragmatic about how that should come about, what length of period it would take, and what are the implications for communities and industry in this country. So I think to come here and simply, as the Greens do, say we're going to decarbonise the economy, we're going to take that to the next election, fine. But I think that's why you end up with about a 10 per cent vote because people don't believe that you're actually dealing with the wider problems. You see, you, the, Greens don't, yeah. the Greens have got a great luxury of never going to govern. So the luxury they have is that they can take these positions, focus in on the 10 per cent vote that they've got now, and try to ensure that that 10 per cent showed up. And talking about decarbonisation of the economy, talking as if they are the only ones that care about the future for our grandkids is a bit rich, I reckon. So I, I, sorry, Sarah, what did you say? Senator Cameron, ignore the interjections. Thank yeah. you. It was a great interjection, but it didn't make any sense. Now, I'm a big supporter of uh, doing something about climate change, big supporter. And I think it would have been much better if back in 2009, uh, the ETS, uh, the ETS, had been picked up by the Greens, and they didn't have their eye on a double dissolution. They didn't have their eye on trying to get more seats in the Senate if a double dissolution came up, because the ETS would have been in place. The arguments that we are still facing now about, uh, about pricing carbon would have been long gone, and we would have been on the road to making any changes we could have made, because the public would have accepted that, that we were in this place. The Greens actually, because of their a mixture of, of, of actual purity, a mixture of purity and, and political expedience uh, just ignored what was in the interest of the, of the nation. So I'm just not going to be lectured by the Greens on this, and I just don't think it's reasonable that the public uh, should ignore some of the costs that are involved in moving to a complete decarbonisation, what the job impacts are on, on complete decarbonisation, how we can bring the public with us. And I think the big problem for the Greens is that you've got a coalition whose leadership do not agree that carbon is causing a problem in the atmosphere. They don't agree with it. So it's a job for Labour and the Greens to actually educate the public about why we need to do this, because it will be a contested political debate, a strongly co contested political debate. So to simply say we're going to move from where we are now to decarbonisation, I think gives those in the opposition who are opposed to climate change, those who do not believe in climate change, an easy attack point on communities and people who rely on coal and rely on carbon for their jobs. So we must educate. We must organise around this issue. We must get out there and make sure the public understand all of the realities that the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology are telling, telling us about these problems. And not just say there's going to be a magic wand of decarbonisation and everything's going to be okay. 
This will be a hard political battle, and it will go on after the election. It's a battle about how we can make sure that we don't have global warming that destroys the capacity for people to live in areas around this country. So I think some sense from the Greens, less pontification, less purity would be good for this parliament.
Now, I'm not sure what the Greens will say if, uh, if the um, AEMO starts looking at uh, the issue of carbon capture and storage. That would be a horror for them. But it's a practical thing that some of the major uh, corporations around the world are looking at. Because without carbon capture and storage, our steel industries, our, our, uh, our, our um, uh, other industries that are relying on carbon for processes are in real trouble. So I just don't accept these, the pontification and this lecture that we get uh, from the coalition. The other issue is in, in the report, the, the IEMO report, they say that 100% renewable energy is possible, but at a cost at a cost. And their estimated costs, and they say these are hypo hypothetical costs because there's a range of costs that you'd have to add on to it, uh, but in two, two, 2030, between 219 billion and 285 billion. In 2050, 252 billion to 332 billion. Now that's the, hi that's the hypothetical cost to do this. And they say one of the big issues is the distribution network. Now, Spain, as every senator here would understand, is a much different uh, nation to Australia in terms of where its cities are, how big the cities are, the small size of the country, where they can actually do this work. big problem we have is that we would have to run from some of the areas where we could actually uh, do some of the, the thermal um, uh, power capacity, we'd have to have huge distribution networks. And that has not been costed in to those figures that I've indicated. Now, I'm not saying this to say why we shouldn't do it. I'm saying that these are the challenges that we have to face. Because I, agree, I, I totally agree that climate change is real. But it's not like going from Malaga in the south of Spain up to Seville and then up to Madrid, where you've got major you know, uh, major centres, big cities with thermal power uh, available. Uh, you just can't do that in Australia so easily, where the cost of transmission is much easier because they can actually get some of the, uh, some of the, the networks close to the, the big cities. The other issue is the cost of securing land to do all of this that, that uh, AIMO has uh, outlined. And other inputs like biofuels. I mean, what's the, what's, the, what's the cost of biofuels? How much land do we need to get the biofuels? 